Tariff Wars, who gets hurt the most? It's time for U.S. World Report. Here's Tom Osborne. These are the stories making headlines this week. The divers searching for the boys almost gave up. Then they had a near-perfect rescue mission. The story of the 12 Thai soccer players and their coach who had to be rescued from a flooded cave in northern Thailand by more than a dozen international divers and Thai Navy SEALs has enthralled the world for the past 10 days. Though a mission to bring them out through the cave at first seemed impossible, rescuers eventually came up with a scheme that involved fitting the boys with dive masks and wrapping them on stretchers to transport them out of the cave safely. John Belanthan, one of the two divers who found the 12 boys and their football coach in the Tom Luang Cave Complex, paid tribute to Saman Kunan, a Thai Navy SEAL who died during the rescue operation. A huge iceberg drifting close to a Greenland village is causing fears of a tsunami. An iceberg the size of a hill has drifted close to this village on the western coast of Greenland, causing fear that it could swamp the settlement. President Trump doubles down against U.S. allies at the NATO meeting in Brussels, castigating Germany as a captive of Russia and berating the other members of NATO for not meeting their share of defense spending, threatening more tariffs if members don't meet their annual 2% of GDP or more. Western countries, beginning with France, have said no such agreement was reached. Germany's foreign minister rejected suggestions that Berlin could be browbeaten by President Trump into hiking military spending, saying that his country would make its own sovereign decisions on debt and tariffs. President Trump said he had a very strong relationship with British Prime Minister Theresa May, having earlier scorned her Brexit strategy. Their summit showcases Western reaction to a planned meeting with Vladimir Putin on a one-to-one basis with just the two leaders, President Trump, Vladimir Putin. Which brings us to our story of the week, U.S. tariffs. Who gets hurt the most? And here is Dr. David Canervo, our resident historian and political scientist, to bring us the backstory. David? Thank you, Tom. A tariff is a tax on imported goods. It is used to make imported material more expensive so that there will be a higher demand for similar domestic products. Tariffs, therefore, protect emerging or, in some cases, aging domestic industries and provide income for the country charging the tariff. American tariffs began under President Washington and his Treasury Secretary, Alexander Hamilton. The Tariff Act of 1789 was the second piece of legislation signed into law by Washington and was seen as a benefit to national security because it would lead to a greater supply of domestically produced goods, including war material. Washington believed that political independence was based on economic independence. From 1871 to 1913, the average U.S. tariff on imports never fell below 38 percent and at the same time, gross national product grew 4.3% annually. Tariffs were the greatest source of federal revenue until the income tax became legal in 1913. After 1945, the United States became a largely free trading nation and continued that policy with few exceptions until the Trump administration tariffs that began this month. Ken? Well, thank you, David. Before we get started, I wanted to announce that U.S. World Report has an email address for our audience to send in their comments, and it's pretty simple. It's www.usworldreport at gmail.com. Now, let's begin with this clip from CNN that may help to explain the current trade war with China. The White House is confident it can win its trade confrontation with China. You see what's happening with China. We have no choice. This should have been done many years ago. We have no choice. President Trump vowing to fight back in a trade war he says was started decades ago by the Chinese. His strategy, to punish China, which the U.S. accuses of stealing technology and trade secrets, and for unfairly treating U.S. companies who want to do business there. Now, the U.S. targeting technology that China has vowed to dominate, Xi Jinping's Made in China 2025 initiative, China 2025 is an ambitious national goal to lead and control industries like robotics, electric cars, and computer chips. The U.S. calls those industrially significant technologies and is slapping a 25% tariff on 1,100 product categories like aerospace, robotics, high-end manufacturing, and autos. 
Who pays? U.S. companies will pay the tariff to the U.S. government when they import the goods. Companies can either absorb the higher cost or pass it along to consumers. Now, part two of the president's strategy, export controls or investment restrictions. A plan is in the works to limit what American technology Chinese companies and citizens can buy. Now, the White House believes it has the edge. China has more to lose than the U.S. since China's economy relies so much on exports to the U.S., $500 billion worth last year. And the president's economic advisors are confident the U.S. economy is so strong right now, it can absorb the hit of a tariff dispute. Oxford Economics predicts the China tariffs would only shave about two-tenths of a percentage point off economic growth next year. Of course, that all assumes there's not a protracted global trade war, something economists say is impossible to predict. As strong as the economy is claiming to be, or being claimed to be, Harley-Davidson is not having a good year. The, the motorcycle company in January, struggling to reverse a four-year slide in sales, had to close its Kansas City factory. And now President Donald Trump, who seems as if he'd like to be a Harley man, has added to its woes. This week's announcement of steel tariffs on U.S. imports could add $30 million to the company's costs, according to Wedbush Securities, an investment firm. Tom Osborne. Would you like to weigh in on this? Well, as we approach the uh, international debate, which has now ensued, it affects us coast to coast. Uh, we should keep in mind that a tariff, as David suggests, is a customs tax, a levy on imported goods. And the tax is a percentage of the total cost of the product, including uh, the freight and insurance. Tariffs work by increasing the price of the import. Those higher prices give an advantage to domestic products within the same market. But tariffs are a barrier to international trade. Other countries retaliate and impose their own tariffs. And over time, tariffs reduce business for all countries, including the United States. President Trump says he will make better deals now that we are out of TPP and NAFTA, but not fast enough to save the billions that farmers in American agriculture will suffer first and the most, as always, which I'll say more about later. As far as China is concerned, the uh, administration has uh, actually projected a lot of consternation. Representatives of all political stripes are asking, why this now? The increased economic aggressiveness within the Trump administration has escalated the mounting trade war with China by publishing a list of $200 billion worth of Chinese goods to be hit by an additional 10%. The Wall Street Journal reports that China has criticized the new threat as totally unacceptable and says it will take collective countermeasures. This, of course, would deepen the trade war between the U.S. and China and would affect the cost of a host of goods the U.S. imports. Senate Finance Chairman Orrin Hatch called the new tariffs reckless and untargeted, and not to mix oranges and apples, but only last week Hatch predicted Trump would be the greatest president in the history of this country, and that is a quote. And from the publication The Hill, Senator Jeff Flake, a Republican and a frequent critic of the president, was instrumental in reaching an agreement with the GOP leadership to get that non-binding vote to instruct negotiators on a spending bill to give Congress more authority over the president's ability to implement tariffs for national security reasons. This, of course, sending a symbolic message, basically meaningless, compared to what could be done in response. Ken? Well, getting back to Harley for a moment, about 16% of Harley's sales are to Europe, and the company has warned that in addition to the effects of metal import tariffs in driving up manufacturing costs, a punitive retaliatory tariff on Harley-Davidson motorcycles in any market would have a significant impact on their sales and their dealers, their suppliers, and their customers. For Harley, the threat of tariffs has a ring of familiarity. Uh, Dr. Canervo, in 2003, the EU also threatened additional tax levies on its bikes after George W. Bush sought taxes on imported steel. Can you comment on that? Well, yes, Ken. Uh, it seems to me that, uh, as you mentioned, Harley has been through this before. We, from time to time, go back and forth on whether we're going to have tariffs or not. Uh, one of the things that uh, I guess Harley is unwilling to do is see whether uh, the steel manufacturers in this country can expand rapidly enough 
to produce steel at a price which would benefit their company. And uh, because of the, uh, of course, tariffs from other countries, they're moving their plant, at least to uh, one of them, to Asia, so as to prevent the uh, use of tariffs against them in that part of the world as well. Ken? You're listening to U.S. World Report with Tom Osborne, Dr. David Canervo, Mary Saliba, and Ken McCaleb. And we'll be back right after this. Welcome back to U.S. World Report with Tom Osborne, Dr. David Canervo, Mary Saliba, and Ken McCaleb. This next audio clip is from the BBC News, and it's titled, Results of the NATO Summit. Let's give it a listen. For years, presidents have been coming to these meetings and uh, talked about the expense, the tremendous expense for the United States, and uh, tremendous progress has been made. Everyone's agreed to substantially up their commitment. They're going to up it at levels that they've never thought of before. Uh, Prior to last year, where I attended my first meeting, it was going down. Uh, The amount of money being spent by uh, countries was going down and down very substantially. And now it's going up very substantially. And commitments were made. Uh, Only five of 29 countries were making their commitment. uh, And that's now changed. The commitment was at 2 percent. Ultimately, that'll be going up quite a bit higher than that. So we are, uh, we made a tremendous amount of progress today. Uh, It's been about, at a minimum, they estimate, and they're going to be giving you exact numbers. But since last year, they've raised an additional $33 billion uh, that's been put up by the various countries, not including the United States. And the United States' uh, commitment to NATO is very strong, remains very strong but primarily because everyone, the spirit they have, uh, the amount of money they're willing to spend, the additional money that they will be putting up has been really, uh, really amazing to see it. To see the level of spirit in that room is incredible. And I hope that we're going to be able to get along with Russia. I think that we probably will be able to. Uh, The people in the room think so, but uh, they nevertheless, they really stepped up their commitment and uh, stepped it up like they never have before. Tom Osborne, can you explain to our audience what he's talking about, getting along with Russia, and some of your research on NATO and how it might relate to today's topic of tariff wars? Well, let's start with business first. France immediately responded this morning, saying they absolutely did not agree to anything like increasing 2%. That remains the same. So uh, the president is mistaken on that. We could start with the overall Trump strategy, which we all have seen here at home, but on the international stage of NATO, it was clearly revealed in the press conference at the end of the NATO meeting. Trump's strategy was on international view. He lays the foundation to form a narrative that he wants to continue in a moment like that when he has the stage. So the narrative he was creating there was a problem. He beat everybody up, walked out solving it, And that is how NATO is now a fine-tuned machine, which, of course, is not true. So before that foundation can set, it is important to check facts and recheck. And that is what I hope we can do today, particularly since NATO was the jumping-off point for the president to reaffirm the tariff war the U.S. is now waging against the rest of the world. It's the politics of grievance, as some have put it. The definition of tariff is simply custom taxes, but this has a political commentary that follows it all the way to Russia and across uh, the various countries that we have as allies. Countries waive tariffs when there is free trade agreements with each other. The United States has trade agreements exports to these countries. They use trade agreements to execute an intelligent market entry strategy. The foreign customers pay less for U.S. exports because they are tariff-free. U.S. policymakers go back and forth, of course, on whether tariffs are good or not. When a domestic industry feels threatened, it asks Congress to tax its foreign competitors or imports. It helps that sector, and that often creates more jobs. Growth in that industry improves workers' lives, but also raises import prices for consumers. So there's a trade-off. Tariffs always force a trade-off between workers and consumers. Another disadvantage of tariffs is that other countries retaliate, as we've seen. 
They raise tariffs on similar products to protect their domestic industry. That leads, of course, to downward spiral of economic situations, as it did during the Great Depression in 1929. This NATO appearance was part and parcel of what the president does. First, it is the politics of destruction, then the politics of a new narrative that we've seen. Many questions are being asked across the country about the policies that the president has proposed in the meeting with NATO, but many are questioning whether or not they can trust the president or not. Ken? Well, Dr. Canervo, the European Union is obviously reacting harshly. European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker says the tariffs are protectionism, pure and simple, and the U.S. should expect counterbalancing measures from Europe soon. Mexico, too, says it will answer tariffs on steel and aluminum with duties of its own on a variety of U.S. products. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau called the tariffs totally unacceptable, and the Canadian government announced retaliatory measures of its own. Dr. Canerva, my question then is, I have two. Will these tariffs cause a recession, and when will things start to cost more? Well, uh, to answer your first question, it's not clear whether they will cause a recession or not. The uh, so-called Smoot-Hawley tariff of, of 1931 while it is sometimes blamed for the Great Depression that occurred uh, following it, some economists argue uh, really had only a fairly minimal impact on the uh, contraction that occurred in our economy and that much more impact occurred from other things such as monetary policy rather than the tariff itself. So it's not clear. And of course, in the uh, example that I gave of the United States during uh, the pre-World War II era, when we did have uh, fairly significant tariffs, we still continued to grow at a a pretty hefty 4.3% annual rate. And so, while certainly there is bound to be some damage in the first year or two, the question is then whether domestic industries will be able to provide the products that we're no longer getting from outside the country in sufficient quantities to keep the prices down. But secondly, can we find then other markets for uh, American products which are facing tariffs in Europe and in China? And of course, that is what remains to be seen. There is a, a $92 billion trade deficit between the United States and um, the EU. And so that's fairly significant. And of course, a trade deficit means that more wealth is leaving the United States than is coming in to the United States. And so that's obviously a significant problem as far as uh, Donald Trump is concerned. Ken? Well, the president has a lot of constitutional authority to levy tariffs. Initially, the Constitution gave Congress the right to regulate trade between the U.S. and other nations. But over the past century, Congress passed a series of laws that gradually transferred trade powers to the president. Tom, why is this? The Congress has nearly unanimously expressed uh, itself and continued support and strength of NATO. It is a non-binding resolution. But uh, we have 70 years of this alliance, and it's been the bulwark of our defense against the old Soviet Union and the Cold War, and now the ambitious Russian Federation and Vladimir Putin. Uh, Truman, who had determined that the road to global war had come through isolationism, and so there was a determined attempt then to re-engage the world and remain engaged in it so that we could not retreat behind fortresses, behind walls. Build the wall is the cry. That's the wrong direction. Truman determined in Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, and Bush, the first and second followed through. We would not put America first, the motto of isolationists of the 1930s. That we would remain engaged and therefore isolationism would not return. Thus, all of the various agencies like NATO, WTO, the United Nations itself, and on and on were created to avoid economic conflicts that lead to hot shooting wars. That led to the Great Depression as well as the deadliest of wars. Vladimir Putin's great goal is not only to disrupt NATO, but particularly disrupt the real relationship between Germany and the United States. And this is a dream come true for him. Ken? 
Uh, David, in our last 30 seconds, what is tariff money used for? Well, it is used for whatever the Congress chooses to use it for. It becomes part of the general fund of the United States and uh, can be used for anything. It could be used for building the wall so that uh, ultimately China and Mexico uh, do build the wall, or it could be used for national defense or anything else. Ken? You're listening to U.S. World Report with Tom Osborne, Dr. David Canervo, Mary Saliba, and Ken McCaleb. And we're up against a heartbreak, but we'll be back right after these messages. Welcome to U.S. World Report. I'm David Canervo, along with Tom Osborne, Ken McCaleb, and Mary Saliba, and we're talking about trade wars. Ken? Thank you, David. Here's a Fox News audio clip about a farmer in Iowa and how he's dealing with the tariff wars. Trade retaliation hitting farmers across the nation. China says it's slapping tariffs on more than 100 key U.S. imports, including cars, soybeans, and pork. That's in response to the White House plans for tariffs on $50 billion worth of Chinese imports. So what impact does this have on our farmers? Here now is Casey Guernsey, a seventh-generation farmer and former Missouri state legislator. You know, you are a farmer by trade. You grew up on a family farm where you raised cattle, uh, you raised pork. Tell me, you have said that this retaliation from China has already hurt farmers. Can you explain that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, not just in terms of commodity prices, but uh, in terms of what we have to plan for for the coming year. This is an important time of the year where farmers make their decisions on their operations, whether to invest in equipment, whether to plant varieties of commodities, um, what to do with their herds, how to work on their forward contracting. It's a big time, important time of year, and it's stressful anyway. So whenever you have something like this on top of it, it adds a level of stress. You know, another thing that we've heard, uh, Jeff Flock was reporting yesterday that when those prices for soy, for example, was dropping, China basically came in and bought. That can't make farmers happy. But the question is, is the, is the short-term pain worth the long-term payoff that President Trump is hoping to achieve? We understand what the president's trying to do, and we understand that we in agriculture are being absolutely targeted by the Chinese, and especially considering that we're also a group that supports President Trump. And we believe that he has our best interests in mind and that he is going to work for the best possible deal, and that's why we supported him. But that doesn't mean that we are in favor of these retaliatory-type actions as it relates to these tariffs that are being implemented. We would rather him focus on negotiating the best possible deal with NAFTA that could be had. And we believe that he can do and improve NAFTA. And that's what we would encourage him and his folks in the U.S. Trade Office to do. David, would you care to comment on the clip we've just listened to? Yes, Ken. What is certainly right about what the farmer said is that uh, agricultural products exported from this country are, in fact, very much in the crosshairs of China and the EU both. The United States is a magnificent producer of food and agricultural products. And the fact that we have such an abundance means that we have to export it in order for the farmers to do well. Otherwise, the demand for the products is too low and the prices decline and the farmers don't do very well economically. So finding markets for the agricultural products is is essential for them to do well We had been successful in past years, of course, getting China to buy, I think it's about 60% of our uh, soybeans, of uh, some of our corn and pork and other items as well that we do send overseas. The uh, Europeans, similarly, buy some of our products, though they have been less uh, willing to buy American agricultural products because uh, they... uh, do not like to buy what we call GMOs, that is, products which have been genetically modified, as we do with corn and soybean and wheat and some of the other agricultural products, because they are uh, supposedly afraid of it. But let's face it, they're protecting their own markets as well. So the point is that farmers are being targeted, and they're being targeted because they are political supporters of Trump, and they're trying to weaken Trump's political base. Ken? 
I want to continue this talk about agriculture with you in a moment, Tom, but I also wanted to say that as a result of the new import taxes on steel, the largest nail manufacturer in the United States is on the verge of closing. It's called the Mid-Continent Nail Company, based in Missouri, has already laid off 12% of its workforce due to higher costs. Even if it's able to stay open, it may be forced to move its plant to Mexico in order to stay competitive. So, Tom, let's get back to agriculture for a moment. Sure, Ken. I think this is probably one of the most important subjects that we could address in this week's program because we're looking at the tip of the spear when we're talking about these measures of tariffs as it goes towards agriculture. Some reaction from Capitol Hill that uh, you probably have not heard yet, but from Senator Bob Corker, Republican of Tennessee, echoes the sentiment saying that what worries him is the fact that I know that no one at the White House can articulate what it is they are hoping to accomplish. That worries me. Also very significantly is the reaction of the agriculture and farming throughout the U.S. Senator Mike Rounds of South Dakota, always outspoken but soft-spoken, he's another Republican senator sounding farmer's alarm over the administration's course. He says the message has been sent, addressed in the Senate, in a non-binding resolution questioning the imminent moves against China. Senator Ron said further, we have farmers and ranchers in the upper Midwest that are bringing their products to market at this time. Winter wheat is being harvested in South Dakota right now, and it won't be long until soybeans and the corn that will be harvested The markets right now for commodities are going down. Soybeans are down a dollar and ninety-five cents a bushel since March first. Rounds continued, if you take a look at just in South Dakota, we're not a big state. If you just take a look at the farming operations in South Dakota right now, the difference between March first prices and what we've got right now in the prices of today, these tariffs will cost three quarters of a billion dollars in impact on the balance sheets for farmers and ranchers. And so for them, this is a real serious issue. And I lived out in South Dakota, and I know what it's like when farm prices take a dip. It means everything. It means a whole season. And it's not a matter of saying, yeah, I'm going to suggest we might be putting in tariffs, because markets react immediately. And the markets are doing just that. They're down. Rounds closes with this thought. He says the administration has to account for the possibility that China might very well not buy as many soybeans as they used to. Just as an example, soybeans are 60% of what we export going to China. They amount to 25% of all the soybeans that are produced in the United States. Ken? Well, Dr. Canervo, Clarksville, Tennessee, your hometown, is already trying to recover from a loss of a planned 1.2 billion hemlock semiconductor plant canceled in the wake of solar panel-based trade disputes between U.S. and China when the Trump administration's washing machine tariff proposal threatened an LG electronics factory. Tennessee farmers like Jimmy Tosh, who employs nearly 400 people, are also struggling with the potential pork tariffs threatened by China in response to President Trump's proposed steel and aluminum tariffs. The price of rebar, a basic component in many construction operations, has jumped 17% since those proposed tariffs, making any expansion by existing businesses considerably more expensive. And another company, Electrolux, has recently announced plans for a $250 million plant expansion in Springfield, Tennessee. But the project's on hold after President Trump announced his proposed steel and aluminum tariffs. Dr. David Canerva, are you seeing signs of this in your hometown? Yes, absolutely. We are seeing people who are uh, very worried about the future. If you you mentioned the rebar, for example, Nashville and Clarksville both are cities that are growing fairly rapidly. And so the construction industry is going to be badly hurt by the uh, increased cost of rebar. The, uh, the plant, the hemlock plant that you mentioned that uh, was withdrawn from Clarksville for the semiconductor business was going to be a producer of polysilicone materials, which are used in the uh, components themselves and used as very much in the, in the solar panel business. The fact that that plant had to shut down cost a lot of people their jobs. We had gone through a lot of trouble to uh, educate people into that business, make them trained 
ahead of time. And then once the plant was actually completely built, they decided then not to open it. And the uh, reason was because of Chinese manipulation of the market. And, and that's the other side of the coin with all this. There's, there's a lot of pain being caused by the tariffs, but at the same time, China has caused a lot of pain through its manipulation of markets, currency, and through theft of technology. Ken? You're listening to U.S. World Report, and we'll be back right after these messages, so stay with us. Welcome back to U.S. World Report. Today we're talking about the tariff wars and the impact here in the United States. Ken? Thanks, Tom. This clip is from HBO and really exposes the vulnerability felt by cattle farmers in the announced U.S.-China tariffs. President Trump promised today that even though he may be starting a trade war with China, American farmers would come out ahead. If during the course of a negotiation, They want to hit the farmers because they think that hits me. We'll make it up to them. And in the end, they're going to be much stronger than they are right now. But growers like Steve Frick, who runs a small farm in Illinois and serves as president of the local county farm bureau, are already feeling the pain. We're about half done with what we have for calving. And we have about 10 more that will have babies here pretty soon. We grow corn, soybeans, wheat, and a little bit of hay to feed the cows. We've made our plans for the year, and now here in one day, they changed our whole plan. This year was supposed to be the first time in about 35 years that the United States has grown more soybeans than corn because there was more money in soybeans. Right now, for just for the state of Illinois, we took about $200 million out of farmers' pockets with this drop in price since the tariff was announced. While his gross income should be about $240,000, Frick said the proposed tariffs will knock off about 20% of that. But his expenses, as much as $180,000 a year, won't change. The bottom line? Frick usually nets at least $60,000. This year, he expects to make a fraction of that. We're just going to, we will take a hit. As we look at that field, we just needed how many dollars of loss is that going to be for us for this fall? So you're a Republican and you supported Donald Trump in 2016. Mm-hmm. Why did you support him? <laughs> I, I think the biggest reason that I supported him is because I still believe in you know, individual responsibility and smaller government. It was interesting to see how the economy of the country has changed in this short time since this election has taken place. You've got to be a little bit disappointed, though, that that positive growth comes at your expense. <laughs> We knew that we were going to have to pay some price. We just didn't want to pay the whole price. I have to say it sounds a little bit like President Trump sort of left farmers behind. Well, that's a little bit how we're feeling. I don't want to say that I don't support the Republican Party right now or or President Trump, but there's some of these issues I'd sure like to see different. Tom Osborne, how do you react to what we've just heard? Well, Ken, I, I hear the farmers saying that the president is asking them to give him more time. And this will be great, as he often does, but uh, give him more time. We can buy time on some of the metal tariffs, but not agriculture. Farmers are wondering if the administration really understands that time is of the essence. Many have uh, produced and will tell, speak their message loud and clear that they believe that the president is doing what he believes is right, and they want him to succeed, but he has to understand that they are at the tip of the spear right now, and time is of essence. They tell us what your game plan is. That's the question they're asking. What is your game plan? Tell us what you want to accomplish. Give us some confidence that this is going to end well. And that's the message farmers are sharing, and it's a heads up. This cannot go on for an extended period of time without assuring our ag producers that they're not going to be the one that are going to take the brunt of this. It's been five years of falling ag prices. Ag income is down 50% in the last five years. So now to have them at the tip of the spear and seeing soybeans down, corn down, wheat down, and no end in sight, that has got a lot of people who are very strong supporters of the president concerned. 
what they want to see is evidence of success. Senator Mike Rounds uh, summarized it best by saying, the example is the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, that was going to provide us with half a billion people in the Pacific Rim that would be buying our product. Back in January a year ago, the administration said, we're not going to take it. We are going to do individual trade deals. None of them are done. Then we had NAFTA, and we're going to have a better deal. So far, we don't have any deal at all. And now we're talking about delaying that once again. Ken? Well, the North American Free Trade Agreement currently being renegotiated allows U.S. barley farmers to export their crops to Mexico without paying import taxes. And in the last decade alone, the U.S. farmers sold $1.82 billion worth of barley to Mexico. Now, if the United States were to withdraw from NAFTA, resulting trade restrictions could not only hurt American grain farmers, but increase the price of beer sold back to the U.S. by the Mexican brewers. Dr. Canerbo, who gets to decide about these exemptions back and forth? Well, that's one of the things that the trade negotiators and, to a certain extent, uh, Congress, if they wish to, can exercise their judgment as well as to what products are exempted and which ones are not. And, and that's part of the problem in that uh, not all goods are treated equally. And so we're, we're deciding which uh, segment of the economy will be benefited and which segment of the economy will be hurt without equal treatment, equal pain or equal benefit to everybody. Yeah. Well, I'd like to ask a follow-up of you, David. Um, how will this affect our savings, like uh, 401ks and other savings plans? Well, one of the things it, of course, could do is make products which come into the United States more expensive, which is inflationary. So it will mean that the money that we have set aside for retirement won't go quite as far as it otherwise might. And, and so that's, again, uh, a problem that uh, could occur down the road. The other side of the issue, though, is whether we make enough money from tariffs as a country to perhaps provide some subsidies to those who are, are feeling the pain from the tariffs as well. Ken? Well, import and export taxes makes it more expensive for users of foreign goods, causing a decline in imports, a decline in the supply of the good, and a resulting increase in the price of the good. And the price increase usually motivates domestic producers to increase their output of the product. But with all the product that our farmers are producing and unable to even pick off the farm because of uh, foreign workers that have been exported out of the country, this seems to be a spiraling situation going out of control. Tom Osborne? Well, it doesn't put us in any position of strength, Ken, to negotiate with China now or anyone. And that is not exactly the way even the president has suggested he wanted to negotiate differently. Uh, in my part of the country, or our part of the country, David and I in Tennessee, the country people want to see this president succeed. They don't understand the tactics he's using to get there, however. And agriculture has been a strong supporter of the president, but are beginning to question this support. We talked about the soybean producers today, and the representatives of the American Farm Bureau, all of them, have said the same thing. There are not the best deals out there, but it has gotten a lot worse in the last couple of months. They're asking, what is the plan? Where are we going with this? And is it going to hurt our pocketbooks if we don't get something done? The actions the administrations are taking now have real impact on real Americans who want to be supportive of this administration's plans. Ken? This week's Rapid Fire is a little different. I'm going to ask um, you to make a choice of A, B, C, D, or E. A tariff on imports benefits domestic producers of the imported good because A, they get the tariff revenue, B, it raises the price for which they can sell the product on the domestic market, C, it prevents imports from rising above a specified quantity, D, it reduces the producer's surplus, making them more efficient, or E, all of the above. David? I'm not sure I would accept any of the above, frankly. Um, it doesn't seem to me that uh, the producers get the money. It's the federal government who receives the tariff money. It uh, doesn't necessarily lead to uh, less production. And so I'm not sure that any of the scenarios in your multiple-choice question 
necessarily work out well from my perspective. Ken? Well, you're right, it, but it, it actually is B. It raises the price for which they can sell the product. A real quick one, Tom. When a large country levies a tariff on imports, A, the world price falls. B, demanders of the good on the domestic market are hurt. C, foreigners are hurt. D, the domestic price rises by less than the tariff. And E, all of the above. I would go with E, all of the above. Well, uh, the actual answer is foreigners are hurt. You're listening to U.S. World Report with Tom Osborne, Dr. David Canervo, Mary Saliba, and Ken McCaleb. And we're going to take a break, but when we come back, we're going to try and summarize today's program. So stay with us. Welcome back to U.S. World Report, and this is our show summary segment where we get a chance to share some final thoughts, and we now turn to our news team editorialist, Ms. Mary Saliba. Mary? Thanks, Ken. What do Switzerland, Norway, and Canada have in common? They are some of our allies that have filed a complaint against us with the World Trade Organization. The U.S. claims that tariffs on steel and aluminum are needed for national security. Normally, member nations will not act prior to a WTO ruling, such as in 2002, when Bush placed tariffs on steel. He lifted them within a year at a cost to the U.S. economy of about $30 million. This is more isolationism than protectionism, as one of our strongest protections comes from our neighborhood of allies committed to human rights, fair trade, progress, and peace. Sometimes poking the friendly bear will suss out its weaknesses to the benefit of the deal maker. This does not seem to be that game. There is no deal, and allies are striking back. The U.S. seems to be a lone ranger promoting vigilante justice. U.S. first, using power and retaliatory threats, such as the president's recent comment about the WTO. We're not planning anything now, but if they don't treat us properly, we'll be doing something. Our little cart of Campbell soup, Smuckers, a bottle of Jack, and a local paper will all cost more. Small businesses have already folded. Retaliatory tariffs are not accidentally hitting red states hardest, though many believe that they are enduring financial hardship for the greater purpose, that ultimately American jobs and goods will be the strongest in the world. The opposite is true. From the Paris Accord to our criticisms of NAFTA and NATO, we are forcing the hand of our allies not to make better deals with us, but to band together against us. To make America and its products great, we must first invest in the people who will build our future. Supporting education, healthcare, science and technology, housing, living wages. If our democracy is to survive, we must make America a country of progress, of inclusion, not a story of a lonely kingdom counting its money. This has been Mary Saliba for U.S. World Report. Ken? Thanks, Mary. Now, Dr. David Canervo, could you please share with us your final thoughts regarding today's program? Sure. It seems to me that uh, the tariffs have good points and bad points. Let me start with the bad ones. U.S. Tax Foundation has estimated that uh, because of the tariffs, the United States GDP and wages will decrease by one-tenth of one percent, that we'll lose about 79,000 jobs in this country, and that prices will increase, and as a result, our overall tax system will become less progressive. On the other hand, however, it was estimated by Steve Bannon and some others uh, a couple of years ago that a 20% tariff on all goods that Americans buy from other countries could raise $1 trillion for the American Treasury over the next 10 years. It's a lot of money, and I I can't help but wonder if uh, Trump doesn't have the tariffs in mind is a way of bringing in some money. My final thought is that in all of this, rather than dealing with the EU and Canada as enemies, China is the big problem, and China is the one perhaps we need to focus on and leave Europe and Canada alone. Ken? Well, Tom Osborne, as always, you have the final say. Thank you, Ken. David? President Trump says he'll make better deals now that we're out of the TPP and NAFTA, but not fast enough to save the billions that farmers in American agriculture will suffer first and the most as always. 
And that's a subject we'll have to deal with in the future because we're out of time and we hope that we have at least opened a few windows on the world and throughout our country as we face these new economic threats. We thank you for joining us and we look forward to being with you next week as we bring you another edition of U.S. World Report. I'm Tom Osborne with Ken McCaleb, our executive producer, Dr. David Canervo, our resident historian and political advisor, and of course, Mary Saliba, our editorialist. We hope you'll be listening to next week's U.S. World Report. Thanks for listening. <laughs>